Today we're going to be talking about peptides, proteins, and amino acids. Uh, amino acids are the building blocks of the building blocks, the individual units that you need to make proteins and peptides. And these large ones are enzymes that, that actually fabricate the, the, a lot of these molecules, build these molecules that are used for the construction of a cell. All right, the reasons for this lecture on abiogenesis, in case somebody's joining us just right here for the first lecture, uh, Dave Farina posted a video entitled Elucidating the Agenda of James Tour, a Defense of Abiogenesis. You can see the description box below for the link to that video. After watching that video, I was confused about almost every slide and statement that Dave Farina presented. There were numerous gross scientific inaccuracies in his claims, in my opinion. Since others might be likewise confused, I will use the Farina video with timestamps as a launch point for this series of lectures because many people probably believe like Dave Farina believe. And we've got to bring some clarity to this, this thing because it's all wrong. And uh, I'm not sure where you got some of those beliefs, but presumably reading the lay press uh, um, and then maybe some of the claims in the, in the Origin of Life researchers' articles as well. But when you look at the data, it's very different. So we're going to bring some, some uh, clarity to this. And you're going to see little timestamps. Those all refer to that lecture uh, that, that Dave Farina gave so that you can see people actually said this. They actually said the things that I'm quoting. I'm thankful to Dave Farina. Uh, I'm thankful that Dave Farina attempts to teach the layperson about scientific topics on his YouTube channel, Professor Dave Speaks, and that's important. I mean, I'm a research professor. I don't I don't reach the lay public as easily as he does, and uh, I normally am teaching graduate students or undergraduates taking chemistry and uh, writing writing research articles. So, so it's commendable what he does. Uh, I don't have any contest with Dave Farina. I only want to bring c clarity only want to bring clarity. I'm not trying to contest with him. Other synthetic chemists can comment and point out where I am correct or incorrect. I particularly invite a critique from my synthetic chemist colleagues and students studying synthetic chemistry and those studying origin of life in particular. Uh, if you're disputing with something that I say, just give me a reference on it too so that I can look up the reference that you're, to which you're referring. All right, with that, regarding peptide synthesis, in the beginning, some say at 39 minutes and 58 seconds, quote, But more importantly, the mineral surfaces could have acted as naturally occurring organometallic catalysts. These surfaces may have not only performed efficient syntheses, but given the possibility of the surfaces exhibiting chirality, it could have been the case that they preferentially reacted with one particular enantiomeric version of molecules, like perhaps only L-amino acids. This would readily explain their prevalence in proteins, with enzymes arising later to perpetuate the stereochemical bias after their dominance had already been set into place. Whoa! That is an amazing statement. And he shows this slide, the mineral surfaces could have performed organometallic catalyst, and he shows the hooking together of two amino acids to form a, di a dipeptide, two amino acids stuck together. And this is what's called the condensation reaction, meaning that water forms in the process, and he nicely points out the water. Well, condensation reactions occurring in the water, generally, you don't do condensation reactions in water because you're generating water. So the water, you, so if you're in water, it's going to shift the equilibrium back to the starting material. I don't understand why some would suggest that you do condensation reactions in an ocean like this, uh, in water. How can that be? Tell me about that. How do you do condensation reactions in water? Have you any references on these claims? And then some have made a lot of strange claims. Mineral surfaces could have acted. So in other words, you're not sure. If you look up mineral surfaces, people have tried this. People have tried to take mineral surfaces and done, uh, and, and done an antiselective catalysis. Let me know how well that went. Let me know their enantiomeric excesses. I'd really like to see. It's way below homochirality, way, way below under the best of conditions in a pristine laboratory. Doesn't work very well at all. The surfaces may, may have not only performed efficient synthesis, but given the possibility of surfaces exhibiting chirality. Um, do you have any references on that? I'd like to see how clean those are. But you got could, may, and possibly 
right there. And then it could, again, it could have been the case that they preferentially react, reacted with one particular enantiomeric version of molecules, like perhaps only the L amino acids. You got a reference on that? I'll bet you don't. I'll bet you don't. So when some say that, they can't provide references on that. It is pure speculation, but it's could, may, possibly could, perhaps. If you do that, we could have anything happen. It could be that pigs could fly. They could, perhaps, maybe sprout wings and start to fly. We do not do science based on what could happen. We base science on what on probabilities of things happening. And when you take could, may, possibly could, perhaps, in three sentences, you have taken great speculation upon great speculation upon great speculation, and it is utterly crazy. But some people say this. Uh, there was a paper published in Nature on July 10th, 2019 by Matthew Pounder. Now, let me just say Matthew Pounder is an excellent synthetic chemist. I only have the greatest things to say about that young man. Great synthetic chemist. And uh, Nature, again, is the best journal out there in all of the sciences. Nature and science, but Nature, I think, is ranked a little bit higher. And here's what Matthew Pounder, an excellent synthetic chemist, says. In case, in case those who said those things on the last slide, those people who thought those things, thought that, oh, Jim Tour is saying it, so it can't be true. Well, what does Matthew Pounder write in this article in Nature as he's describing the article that he's published in this issue? He writes, quote, peptides are an essential element of life on Earth. They are so highly enmeshed in, physio in physiology that it is difficult to imagine life without them. Peptide biosynthesis is now orchestrated by a complex host of genetically encoded enzymes, but it is inconceivable that these sophisticated and, co and coordinated molecules suddenly emerged at the origin of life. It is inconceivable to a great synthetic chemist who publishing his synthetic chemistry papers in Nature. He said it is inconceivable that these sophisticated and coordinated molecules suddenly emerged at the origin of life. But to some who put out YouTube videos, this is very, very simple. Very simple. Because they could, they may have, they would. Mm -mm. Synthetic chemists don't agree with you. I'm not the only one who doesn't agree with those people who thought such a thing. Moreover, he says, quote, peptides are widely assumed to be products of amino acid polymerization reactions, like we just saw on the last slide. Whilst conceptually simple, in practice, there are good reasons why these reactions are ineffective in water. They're ineffective in water. Like I just told you, these are condensation reactions you're trying to do in water. For example, amino acids, which their pKa is 9.4, uh, which means their acidity constant, are Zwitterionic at physiological pH. I'll teach you more about that in a few slides. Which quenches their nucleophilicity by protonation and electrophilic condensation agents that are active, that activate amino acid monomers can irrevocably block peptide synthesis as well as derivatize amino acid side chain residues. What does that mean? So he has the British spelling there, by the, by the way. But um, uh, because Nature is is a British journal, but but what he's saying is the very, the very zwitterionic nature of all amino acids, it blocks them from being good nucleophiles. The, the, the amine is not a good nucleophile because it's protonated. The electrophilic condensation agents, the agents that you need to react with this, block, will block peptide synthesis, and they'll also derivatize the side chain residues. We talk about side chain residues and what happens with those. So Matthew Pounder goes on to say, quote, our group has reported a method to overcome several long-standing problems of peptide synthesis in water. Remember what I told you? It's hard to envision making peptides from amino acids in water. Synthetic chemists can't even envision that. So he's come up with a way that it might have happened, which avoids uncontrolled polymerization reactions and bypasses amino acids altogether, unquote. Quote, histidine, aspartate, cysteine, serine, threonine, 
and tyrosine, which are essential to enzyme catalysis, but are notoriously difficult to couple by previously reported prebiotic peptide bond forming reactions. So you thought these were all easy? They're not. This is not easy. Now he's come up with an interesting route, and, and uh, uh, you got to give him credit for this, a wonderfully thought-provoking study on the proposed prebiotic peptide synthesis in water to afford racemic and mixed diastereomeric products. He doesn't solve at all the stereochemical problem. None of this is solved. Moreover, he uses this reagent, which he says is, is this cyanide, this amino cyanide reagent. And what he does, which is really clever, generally chemical peptide synthesis, you take the amine and you add it to the carboxyl end of the next one and you keep adding in that way. What he points out in biology, it actually goes from this way. It actually goes from this way where you have the, the, this growing end and this is now attacking in this way. This is the, the root. You're going in the opposite direction. And so he goes through this, this ligation procedure. Every one of these stereogenic centers is randomized. So, so if he makes a tenmer, you'd have two to the tenth possible isomer. So this doesn't solve a whole lot. And, but it's interesting. What he's doing is he's trying to deal with these points that, that uh, uh, people think that you can get, you can just take amino acids and start polymerizing them. So what this does is it, it, it renders useless the Miller-Urey experiment because Miller-Urey says that you make amino acids and then once you have those amino acids that you get from a, 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 a burst of a voltage when you have uh, certain compounds like cyanide and formaldehyde and CO2 present that then you can get some amino acids and you can you can get a lot of different amino acids that way they're all a chiral they're all they're none of them are homochiral but you can get some amino acids so everybody has been trying to uh, uh, get this this chemistry to go off of amino acids and it might have been a red herring Pounder is suggesting that's not the way it works at all because we don't know how to get amino acids to hook together in water. Doesn't work very well at all. Interesting. All right, so let's go back to some of the basics. Let me just teach you some of the basics on amino acids because I know we have many people just, just learning. So amino acids contain both an amine, amino group right there and a carboxylic acid and they exist as Zwitter ions, meaning that this is a base, this is an acid, so this base takes that acidic proton, so they exist as a plus minus Zwitter ions, which are two opposite charges are in the same molecule. Af alpha amino acids have the amino group on the carbon alpha to the carboxylic acid. There's the carboxylic acid, here's the alpha carbon, on that carbon is the amine. Peptides are biologically important polymers comprised of amino acids connected by the peptide bond. Here's the peptide bond. So here's an amino acid. Here's another amino acid. This R group means general groups that hang off. Proteins are very large peptides. Some are aggregates of more than one peptide. And some of these proteins are enzymes, meaning they do catalysis. They, they are the, the, the little building nanomachines of, of the cell. All right, there are 20 common naturally occurring amino acids. We've got to have syntheses for all of these things. And uh, so here's the amino acids, the R group, this R group is different on each one of them. And they have the name, for example, glycine, it's gly, and it's given the one, one uh, letter description G. So everything has got a three letter description and a one letter description. And you have all of these different groups that you can have on there. These are reactive groups. So what happens when people show the types of slides they showed uh, that we saw earlier, they always had that R group, but they never showed the problems. When you have unprotected amino acids, you get, unpro you get unplanned couplings. It doesn't work. And here's, the, here's we go on, here's, here's more of the amino acids. Here's some have hydroxyl groups, some have uh, 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 here, here's a mercaptan, here's a thiol, and a, a mercaptan, a thiol, a sulfide. Here, some have other carboxylic acids hanging off that would compete with the carboxylic acid of the amino acid uh, main moiety itself. Some have amines hanging off. These would compete with the amino end of, of the amino acid. So these are all big problems in synthesis. This has, the, has an amine and a carboxylic acid uh, 
uh, on it. So these, these are, these are in, in a cyclic system. So these are hard to think about how you would make these. And, and have these all in homochiral form. So if you name a peptide, you start at one end, and so you have the alaval lyse or AVK, if you use the one letter description. So you start from the amino end and you go to the carboxyl end like this. With the exception of glycine, all common naturally occurring alpha amino acids have an asymmetric carbon and are chiral. The configuration is S in all ca cases except for cysteine. So you have to deal with a lot of homochirality. So 19 of the 20 amino acids are homochiral, and the one that's not homochiral doesn't have an element that can make it chiral. It's not that it's racemic. It's not a mixture of the two. Nobody's ever made from a prebiotically relevant uh, route, nobody's ever made homochiral amino acids. Never. Nobody's ever done it. Uh, the Miller-Urey experiment doesn't make them homochiral, it makes them racemic, a one-to-one -one mixture. The DL system relates to the configuration of the alpha carbon of an amino acid to that of the three carbon aldose glyceraldehyde. The reason that we don't, we can call this R and S, that's fine, but often the designation D and L is used to reflect back to what a center looks like on, on D glyceraldehyde. complete hydrolysis and amino acid analysis. So peptides, you can take peptides and you can hydrolyze them in acid using 6 molar HCl. They will hydrolyze in water slowly. They fall apart in water. They don't form in water, they fall apart in water. But you can get them to, to decompose much more quickly or you can use enzymatic degradation and bring them back to their basic amino acids. This is what industry does. It takes, it takes peptides, big proteins, and it chops them up into the discrete amino acids. It separates those amino acids, as we'll see, and then it sells those amino acids to people. And then the, the, the uh, uh, prebiotic synthesis crew goes out and buys those amino acids that came from nature. Why didn't they try to make those using prebiotic chemicals? Hmm. Then they have to do exchanges, so they have to separate now all these amino acids that they've generated, so they use an ion exchange chromatography where they have polystyrene and there's some sulfonates that you put on the polystyrene. These are all man-made, human-made polymers, and I should say human-made polymers, and they, and they have these ions on it, and then the different amino acids will stick differently to it. So you put, you put the mixture of amino acids on there and they will separate into bands, and then you can see them coming off. They've got big machines to do this, and then they put these in little bottles and you buy the individual amino acids. The amino acids that people make to make the peptides that that video was referring to came from nature itself. The building blocks came from nature. They didn't make those building blocks. Solid phase peptide synthesis. The carboxyl terminal amino acid is covalently attached to an insoluble polymer. The peptide is synthesized by adding one amino acid at a time to this polymer. After each step, the soluble byproducts and impurities are filtered off. That's why they do this by solid phase synthesis, because you have to wash each time the material off. The completed peptide is then removed by a reaction that selectively breaks the bond from the resin. This is not how these are made in nature. This is, I haven't seen anybody propose such a route prebiotically because it would, it would take, you know, a great imagination to see how this could be done on an early earth. But you first have to protect the amino acid. So people think you can just take these raw amino acids and get them hooked together in a DNA synthesis, uh, a peptide synthesizer. No. So you have to put in what's called an FMOC group on the nitrogen end of the amino acid. So this is the FMOC ally. And that is then hooked on to the, the, uh, um, the polymer. So then this carboxyl group is hooked on to the polymer, so you, you do chemistry. And this is all human-made chemistry. We'll see. These are human-made coupling agents to get this to cleanly go. And so once you've hooked that onto this, this polymer, then, then you have this FMOC protected uh, amino acid on your polymer resin. Then what you do is you use piperidine, which, which will deprotonate this take this off and this further reacts with piperidine uh, uh, to give you this stabilized anion here. Uh, but then you, you've freed up now your next group on here from which you can do a coupling. 
and, and this, this group then comes off and then from which you can do this amine coupling. So the solid phase peptide synthesis, next comes the formation of the first peptide bond, coupling of an FMOC glycine to the free amino group of the resin bound by ALA is affected by DIC and HOBT. Here's what HOBT looks like and here's what DIC looks like. These are all human-made molecules. Humans have thought of ways to synthesize these to get these good efficient bonds. This has been years of research working this thing out. I mean many years. If you look at it for peptide synthesis, it has probably been thousands of years, human years, have been put into being able to do this cleanly. And and so then you'll hook on your next amino acid, but it's FMOC protected. And he's giving us amino acids that have no active side chains. If the amino acid ch has, has side chains like thiol, like uh, uh, carboxyl, hydroxyl, or, or uh, um, amino, all of those have to be protected, come in in protected form. That's how these syntheses are done. This is not easy. Just because you have a machine to do it, it's not easy. The machine has to do a, use, do a lot of things that's based on chemistry that people have programmed into it and put into it. And all these reagents come from natural sources anyway. All the amino acids have already come from natural sources. So we've taken from na nature and we say, hey, look, well, you can do what nature does. Well, you took it from nature. Anyway. So then you do this again and again. The process is carried out again and again and again. And then finally you have on this polymer resin, you have say the sequence you wanted, this, this three amino acid sequence, say. And then what you have to do is you have this peptide bond, you then treat it with trifluoroacetic acid, again, an unnatural compound, and that's acidic enough to cleave this off the resin, that cleaves it off the resin, and then you get your peptide, your, your, your tripeptide in this case. And the reason they do this on a resin is that all these different materials that are generated here, all these different compounds, they have to be washed off. If you can't wash them off, they're going to stay in there. And, and it's hard to do reactions with the byproducts in there. Well, welcome to the origin of life research. And that's what origin of life researchers have to deal with all the time. And so they don't purify it. They just buy the the next step or they make it synthetically and they go on to the next step as, as we've covered before and we'll cover again. And so this is hard to do. The primary structure of a peptide or protein is its covalent sequence of amino acids. You have 20 different amino acids, so think of all the ways that this could be hooked together. You can get cross-linking of disulfide bonds. So you see these cysteine dis uh, has the free thiols. These can cross-link. And this is what, for example, makes hair curly. Uh, and, and when you get your hair done and you want to have your hair uh, reset, you, 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 uh, what you can do is you can reduce this bond and free this. And so you can have your hair straightened. And then you curl it in, in any form you want. And then you re-oxidize the hair. And that reforms these dithiol bonds. And then your hair is fixed in this setup. Cross-linking disulfide bonds may be present. Disulfide bonds like cysteine residues in different parts of the sequence are there and they, they give different conformations to this primary structure. So here's the primary structure where you have these different amino acids hooked together in a certain sequence. And then you'll get some disulfide linkages that, that are here. And then you can get other hyd uh, uh, hydrogen bonding linkages as, as we'll see and other couplings that can occur. Uh, so th these are called residues, each one of these amino acids. So once you make one and it has this, if you just made it randomly in an ocean, you're never going to get the same one again because the possibilities, if you had like, you know, 100 amino acids here, the possibilities are just enormous. So when you have numbers like, I don't know, 10 to the 40th or something, you never make the same thing again. All right, the secondary structure of a peptide or protein describes the relative orientations of the planes of the peptide bonds. Rotation about the carbonyl nitrogen bond is slow. So you have this, this, this partial rigidity in these molecules because of the slow rotation, because of some double bond character in that bond. Hydrogen bonding makes a significant contribution to the secondary structure and two major conformations are the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. So you can have these peptides forming an alpha helix, alpha helical arrangement, or you can have them form what's called a beta pleated sheet type structure. So that you get these, these 
complete three-dimensional descriptions of a protein structure at the atomic level is called the tertiary structure. So you have the primary structure, and then you have the secondary and the tertiary structure. These are all commonly portrayed as ribbon-type structures. Tertiary structure proteins are maintained by disulfide bonds, van der Waals attractions, hydrogen bonds, and electrostatic interactions. So these are complex systems, very complex molecules, with lots of possibilities of how these could form. And these big proteins, these big things, they, they, they don't just spontaneously wrap up into the shape they need to be. There's other enzymes that act upon them that, that, that help these to fold. For example, hemoglobin, these systems that carry oxygen, is an aggregate of individual polypeptide units. You have these dimers hooking together further, so they will have hemes, and they will aggregate. So you have these aggregates of these, these peptides, and these are really complex molecules. All right, regarding peptide synthesis, let me bring you back to this. But more importantly, the mineral surfaces could have acted as naturally occurring organometallic catalysts. We don't know how to do this in solution in the lab, to do anything cleanly. But somewhere under a rock or in an ocean, like it's presupposed here, this is all happening in water. It could have, it may have, possibly could have, and, and it perhaps only reacted with L amino acids. This is, this is all fallacious. This, none, none, of the, none of that is real. None of that happens. It's never been demonstrated, even in a pristine lab, under anything that is remotely related to prebiotically relevant, where, you, where you're just dealing off of a mineral surface. No way. And even if you use modern synthetic methods, we don't know how to do this well in solution. I mean, you just, I mean, the, 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 the buildup of, of material in there after each step it just wipes you out. But somewhere in the ocean, it figured it out. Moreover, it was said, nucleic acids, proteins, these are utterly trivial to synthesize. We even have machines that do it for us. Some suggest that... Jim is constantly talking about how we don't know how to make the four classes of biomolecules, which are nucleic acids, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. This is ridiculous. Nucleic acid synthesis and protein synthesis are utterly trivial. Utterly trivial utterly trivial, then why do people buy all their reagents from companies that isolate their reagents from nature? If it's trivial, why don't they just make it? No, because it's very hard to make these compounds and it's very hard to hook them up. Why do they need such machines? Why not just dump it in a flask or dump it in the ocean? They'll hook it up for you. It's so easy to do that we even figured out how to make machines that do it for us. We type in the sequence we want on a computer, let the machine run, and we can get a DNA strand of any sequence of nucleotides we want or a protein of any sequence of amino acids we want. Yeah, yeah, sounds so easy. Shocker. Some have said any biomolecule is easy to synthesize. Wow. Just remember that, synthetic chemists, I know you're having heart palpitations now, that somebody would make such a claim that there's people out there that really believe that. Why don't you guys just quit your job? Why don't you men and women who work in synthesis just quit your job and, and we'll just have technicians make the biomolecules because they're so easy to synthesize, it's just trivial. And further said, Jim knows this, he's a synthetic chemist. What he probably means is that we haven't seen these biomacromolecules form spontaneously outside of a biological system. But that's not what he says. He does not make the distinction, and this seems deliberate on his part. Form spontaneously, even in a biological system, these don't form spontaneously. It's poof, it's poof. None of this happens. In biology, you got enzymes very carefully putting these things together, and if there's a, if there's a misstep, there's other molecules in there that take care of this. Nothing, nothing forms spontaneously like this. Nothing of any complexity forms spontaneously. No, I didn't know that, and neither does any other synthetic chemist. It's difficult for chemists to make most macromolecules, and usually impossible when restricted to prebiotic chemicals. And much harder for prebiotic earth, where the earth could not buy the 20 amino acids in homochiral form, or the carbohydrates, or the, the nucleotides, or the lipids. And no chemist in her right mind would support the nonsensical claim that any biomolecule is easy to synthesize. Here's what a, 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 a protein synthesizer looks like. You have all these different vessels you have to have and all of this plumbing that it's hooked up to. 
So to say we have machines and this is really easy, look at the research that went into this machine. This is a machine that was just designed in 2020. Now that we've had peptide synthesizers for, for 30 years, 40 years, but there's, the sophisticated ones are just coming out, more sophisticated ones. This is not easy. You don't find this under a rock. And every one of the chemicals in here, every one of these, every one of the, the amino acids in here is selectively protected on the nitrogen. Every one of them is, is uh, uh, if, it, if it has an active side chain, has a protection group on that. Every reagent here is, is uh, highly purified, human-made, human-designed reagent. Every solvent is highly purified. This is not in a bunch of junk water. There's no water. This is all solvent-free, done solvent-free, done, done water-free. Why water-free? Because water hydrolyzes this. this. These reactions wouldn't go in water. But somehow under a rock, it figured it out. Uh, let's look at automated synthesis. Here's a paper published in, in Biostein, uh, uh, in uh, Biostein or Journal of Organic Chemistry in 2014. How, uh, what's involved in this? Well, to form this bond, you've got to remove water just as was shown in this, but you don't remove water when you're in an ocean. You got to do this under anhydrous conditions. You have the N-terminus and the C-terminus. Here's a picture taken right from that article. And before all this, one needs all the peptides in homochiral form, which are made from protein degradation. So you take them from nature. Then you take it and you, N, you, you nitrogen protect, you amine protect, and then you have to side chain protect. Nobody ever mentions this. You have to amine protect, side chain protect, and then you have to uh, choose the solid material that you're going to build this off of, usually some polystyrene bead, or in the case of, of uh, nucleotide synthesis off a glass bead that's properly functionalized. Then you use a linker for the desired C-terminus modification. You have to have some linker to attach this to the polymer bead, and you have to have the, the choice of coupling agents. What coupling agents? Because they don't spontaneously couple. You can mix the two together, they don't spontaneously couple. Amides do not hook up to carboxylic acids. Amines do not hook up to carboxylic acids. You can stir this all, all day at 37 degrees. And uh, if you do it in water, it's certainly not going to go. It's going to go back, if anything. And so again, he's showing this, this FMOC group. That's still what's used in the industry, a T-butyl group. Now you have an active side chain, an active carboxylic acid side chain. So you got you, you, uh, an active uh, side chain here. So you've got to use this, this uh, T-butoxy group to protect it. And then you're going to need TFA to, to pluck these things off. Um, uh, and then remember, this is going to react with PIP piperidine and, and uh, come off here. And then if, if you have, here's a Bach group, here's a Bach protection group, you can also have the Bach protection on the amine group, and then you need TFA to pull this thing off. All right, so all of these different things have to occur. All of these different steps are occurring in that machine, which you say is so simple. This is all, you, you buy the amino acids from a company that got them from nature itself, and then all of this has human-made chemistry. This is not prebiotically relevant. None of what is done in that machine is prebiotically relevant. You don't forget to mention the side chains. The side chains you have to have for each one of the active side chains of the different amino acids, you have to have a particular side chain protecting group. You have to have the right choice of protecting group, so you buy these from companies that make these and sell them for a lot of money. You have the 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 amino acid that's isolated from a natural source and then you've taken human beings have devised chemistry to get just that side chain protected and then deprotect the the and then fmoc protect the amine and deprotect the carboxylic acid and sell those for you to put in each one of those bottles that's used in those dna synthesizers uh, then you have to have the coupling agents. These are the coupling agents that you have to choose from. What's the right coupling agent? Remember we showed DCC and HOBT. There's a lot of different coupling agents that work better for different coupling reactions. And here is the solid phase synthesis. You have the linker, you hook your your protected, your nitrogen protected group, you have your side chain protected group, and then you have your amino acid that you hook on there. And then you wash, you wash all of this. 
get all, all the re other reagents off it that you used for the coupling reaction. And then what you do is you buy some more, your second amino acid that's nitrogen protected using a human made uh, uh, nitrogen protecting group, side chain protected, built by humans for that side chain protection. And you pay a lot for this. And then you hook this up using an activating agent and a coupling agent in anhydrous systems, no water around. And now you get your dimer, all that just to make the dimer. And then it washes through the system and you cycle this on and on. And then you have to break it off the end. You cleave this off the end. Then you have to pull off that nitrogen protecting group and you have to pull off each one of these side chain protecting groups using different chemistry. How efficient is solid phase peptide synthesis? Peptides up to 50 amino acids are routine, while those from 75 to 100 are considered to be difficult. So, and these are small compared to what's out there in, in biological systems. So these are small and they're considered difficult at 100. Over 100 amino acids and most people would recommend that you use bacterial expression systems to prepare the desired molecules. Use some biological system to make it for you. For large peptides, the yield necessary on every step is ridiculously high. 99% yield per step will get you garbage at the end. Most modern protocols expect 99.5% or better yield on every step. You need two steps for every amino acid addition because you have, you, you have the coupling and the deep protection. Coupling and deep protection. We're not even dealing with the yields that the company had to deal with with, the, with making those particular compounds particularly blocked. So assuming a 99.5% yield per step in a 50 amino acid peptide uh, it, in a 50 amino acid peptide will have a yield of 0.995 to the hundredth power because it's 50 amino acids, 100 steps, and we're 99.5% yield, which equals 60%. The problem is you now have 40% of your material that contains, that contain a series of deletions. So some of yours, say, say you were making a 50 mer, some of them are only 49 units. And it's not the same 49 missing from any of those. Some of those might only be 48 units, and it's not the same in each of those. These are normally purified away by HPLC, so use something called high-performance liquid chromatography to purify away the ones that, that, uh, that you don't want. Uh, in some cases, single amino acid differences are very difficult or impossible to separate from the desired material. None of this is easy, even using the machines. Purification is frequently more difficult and time consuming than the actual synthesis. And the typical throughput is 100 milligrams to about 2 grams. You need these commercial high performance liquid chromatography systems to purify this after it comes out of that synthesizer. So that little bench top thing that was shown in that video, I don't even think that that's a peptide synthesizer. I don't. I think that's an HPLC. That's not a peptide synthesizer. But even if it were from that, it has to go into a purification system. Now, how do you make larger ones? You can make larger ones where you can, say, make a 50 mer, and then you can couple the 50 mer to another 50 mer, and that's done through native chemical ligation. But that's all human generated. This is chemistry that's been cleverly designed by human beings. This was not available on a prebiotic earth. And this doesn't go in water. This goes in human made solvents that are water free. So what about the sequence? The sequence of amino acids is essential for peptide synthesis to display function. You have to have the right sequence. But when I mention this in my talks, some say that I, that I am way out of my element. I should not even be mentioning information, some say. Jim is way out of his element when it comes to informatics. I have no business because I'm way out of my element. How dare you mention information? You have to be an informatician to mention information or a YouTuber to mention, mention information storage. You can't mention it if, you, if, you're, if, if, uh, if you're not an informatician because you're way out of your element. Well, in biology, DNA carries the code for how amino acids should be ordered. Transferring that code to RNA, which then builds the proteins. At 8 minutes and 32 seconds on that video that I cite, I argued that there is no information inherent in DNA. There would be no inherent information in the DNA. But even if we gave them the DNA in the structure that they wanted, they wouldn't know how to put all the components together. One can randomly string nucleotides together, and that would be DNA. But there are no codons. 
One needs to string them together in a way that carries codons in order for them to translate the information to RNA synthesis and then protein synthesis. Alphabetic letters strung together randomly do not make words. You don't have to be a PhD informatician to understand this. Alphabetic letters that are randomly hooked together do not make words. Nucleotides randomly hooked together to make DNA do not have any codons. There's no information there. So what was said in that video? Jim is way out of his element when it comes to informatics. Was wrong. Some disagree, retorting. This is just nonsense. He is saying there is no information inherent in the DNA when DNA is inherently information because of the way genes code for proteins when expressed. Jim is way out of his element when it comes to informatics. Then he says something unintelligible about how if the DNA was provided, we still wouldn't know how to put the bacterium together. Again, this is ridiculous, because the DNA is literally what contains the instructions to put the bacterium together. I find it hard to believe that Jim does not understand how gene expression works, so this may just be dishonesty on his part. Um, so, <laughs> there's a lot embedded here. If you hook oligonuclet uh, if you hook nucleotides together randomly, you, do n you have DNA, but you have no information there. Just like if you string together a random bunch of letters, you don't have words. All right, I'll maintain that. And I don't have a PhD in informatics, but I'll maintain that. Uh, now, if you just take DNA, if I gave you the DNA of a bacterium, if I gave you the DNA and all the other components try to put together that bacterium, we'll deal with that in a later, slot, in a later, late, later installment of, of this series. Okay, and where did the amino acid sequence arise in your mineral surface rock? Some suggest that something randomly forms that has catalytic activity of an enzyme to carry out chemical reactions. That's, what was, that's what's implied in this video. But when that enzyme degrades and proteins do degrade in water, how does more of that same enzyme, th that same protein form? So you, you so to say that more just forms, how does it form of the same sequence? This is what I'm getting at. I argued that molecules decompose. So how do you make more of them since nature, nature never kept a laboratory notebook? It never recorded sequence. This is especially true in molecules that bear a specific sequence that carries information, which can cause specific reactions to take place on their structures. But some take issue with this. One of Jim's favorite talking points, which is that long spans of time make abiogenesis less likely rather than more likely because biomolecules have a tendency to degrade. But there are some problems here. First, he is presuming that nature might synthesize one component of life one time and that's it. There's no reason to believe this. If conditions are allowing for some molecule to form or polymerize, then it can be doing that all the time. Making the same sequence? They're going to make the same sequence all the time? You don't really believe that. Mm. No. No. The chances of making the same sequence when you have a, an oligomer of even 20 amino acids long, making the same sequence over and over again? No. Then they say... It polymerizes, then degrades, then polymerizes again. Well, it's not just polymerization reactions. There's a lot of reactions that happen... Hap to happen in a prebiotic earth. But let's just take your, pre your polymerization. He says it polymerizes, degrades, polymerizes again. Whatever biochemical process the molecule will later be involved in, the fact that it degrades is irrelevant if it is constantly being formed as well, and even more irrelevant once self-replication came about, such that a mechanism is in place to continually build copies given the raw components. Whatever biochemical processes the molecule will later be involved in, the fact that it degrades is irrelevant if it is constantly being formed as well, and even more irrelevant once self-replication came about, such that a mechanism is in place to continually build copies given the raw components. To my friends out there who are synthetic chemists and, and are, are groaning at this point that somebody would say such a thing, uh, I feel your pain. The only reason I haven't fallen out of my chair is because I fell out of my chair previously when I first heard that. And then the next time I got in my chair, I fell out again. 
so now I'm, I'm just, just kind of used to this. You know, I've just, just, just been so beat over the head with this thing that I'm not falling out of my chair. But you can get back up into your, into your chair now. Don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll bring this to resolution. Where would these synthetic reactions take place? I mean, where is this going to happen? Well, the one who's been proclaiming this, one proclaims he uh, says this. Hydrothermal vents or volcanic hot springs could have provided the energy required for the polymerization reactions. But my personal favorite explanation involves heterogeneous catalysis over mineral-rich surfaces in tidal pools. The small volume of the pools solves the problem of molecules having to find each other in the ocean, acting essentially like a chemist's flask in a laboratory. A chemist's flask? Mm. So the chemist adds these things in high concentrations and his little tidal pools do it because they kind of evaporate and then, and then, and then water comes in and they evaporate. Um, okay, let's, 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 let's think more about this. So how would you get the same sequence? So if, if they, they form and degrade, form and degrade, how do you get the same sequence? How does this happen? Um, there's this article in Geosciences Frontiers. This is an article on origins of building blocks of life. This is a review article, and this was published in 2017. Here's what's written. How and where did life on Earth originate? To date, various environments have been proposed as plausible sites for the origin of life. However, discussions have focused on a limited stage of chemical evolution or emergence of a specific chemical function of proto-biological systems. It remains unclear what situation could drive all the stages of chemical evolution, ranging from condensation of simple inorganic compounds to the emergence of self-sustained systems that were evolvable into modern ones. He goes on to say, it is indicated from the overviews that completion of the chemical evolution requires at least eight reaction conditions of one, Reductive gas phase. A reductive gas. Remember we read that recently people think that the early Earth was oxidative and not reductive? But in any case, reductive gas phase. Alkaline pH. That means, that means uh, 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 basic. Freezing temperature. Fresh water. Dry, dry, wet cycle. Coupling with high energy reactions. Heating, cooling cycles in water. Extraterrestrial input of life's building blocks and reactive nutrients. The necessity of these mutually exclusive conditions clearly indicate that life's origin did not occur at a single setting. Rather, it required highly diverse and dynamic environments that were connected with each other to allow intra-transportation of reaction products and reactants through fluid circulation. So there's a lot of speculation in there, but it couldn't come from your favorite place, your tidal pool. It also has to have extraterrestrial. So this, this, these writers are suggesting that outer space is going to have to deliver this because we can't figure this thing out here. But again, outer space doesn't solve the problem. It just begs the question and pushes it out somewhere else. So in summary, some suggest, but more importantly, the mineral surfaces could have acted as naturally occurring organometallic catalysts. These surfaces may have not only performed efficient synthesis, but given the possibility that the surface exhibiting chirality, it could have been the case that they preferentially reacted with one particular enantiomeric version of molecules, like perhaps only the L amino acids. This would readily explain the prevalence in proteins with enzymes arising later to perpetuate the stereochemical bias. Every one of those statements is utter nonsense and fallacious, all right? There are no mineral surfaces that give you high amounts of, of induction. They give you very little induction, if at all, and that's in a pristine lab. Uh, that these give you efficient synthesis? I'd like to see the efficient synthesis. The possibility of chirality being induced? No. L amino acids only? No. We haven't shown this. And this whole idea of reactions polymerizing and, and depolymerizing, they're just polymerizing. You have to understand reaction thermodynamics. What happens in reactions is many times you go from starting material, you go from starting material, and those go over some activation barrier into product. Now the starting material is less stable than the product. And so there is a net enthalpy, there's a change in enthalpy, and so the energy to go back 
is greater than the energy that it was going forward. So not everything has a one-to-one -one equilibrium where it just goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Sometimes it goes in one direction and it doesn't go back. It doesn't have enough energy to go back up over the barrier because now the energy is much higher. And so what it does, it goes over other lower reaction pathways to the next step and the next step, and it doesn't go back. This is true with many organic reactions. Not everything polymerizes and forms. This was nonsense. It is also uninformed to suggest that, quote, any biomolecule is easy to synthesize and that protein synthesis is utterly trivial. It's not trivial at all. Thousands of person years and billions of dollars have been poured into cell-free protein synthesis. It is anything but trivial, as suggested. The amino acids now come from nature. The way we make proteins in these machines, we get the amino acids from nature. We don't make them synthetically. And even if we could do this, in homochiral form for all of them using our modern synthetic methods of, of, of synthesis and separation, none of that would be prebiotically relevant. Some provide, or it does not happen under a rock or in a tidal pool. Some provide no chemical mechanism how this could have taken place. None. They just simply say that it could, possibly, may, perhaps, over and over again without showing references to back up the claims. And when a citation is given, it is misinterpreted and mischaracterized by some. This is the extent that it's gotten. It's just gotten really bad. So now we, we just learned about peptides. And that's just, just uh, so we've already learned about carbohydrates and peptides. Now we're going to go on to nucleotides in the next video. So if you're interested in that, you can just subscribe by pushing on this button here. And uh, you subscribe and we'll alert you when the next video comes out, which is going to be real soon. And you can learn about the next class of compounds, nucleotides. Thanks for joining us. If you want to subscribe, just click right here, subscribe, and we'll give you a shout out when the next video in this series comes out.